I had a mysterious call in the middle of the night from a friend of mine who lived and worked in theater in New York. And he called me and he said, uh, I've been talking with my mom and Betty Leggett and Leela Pickett and uh, several of their cronies and we are, we have decided that uh, you are the person that should produce our outdoor drama for the uh, for the bicentennial celebration. That's going to be the biggest part of what Southport does for the bicentennial. And uh, so I'm calling to ask you if you would consider producing Revolution. And uh, we've already settled on the name and all that, so uh, it'll be called Revolution. And we would like to say that you're gonna be the producer. And I said, oh yeah, I'd be glad to do that one. And then my next sentence was, well, what does a producer do? Because I knew nothing about producing theater, but I got a crash course from Lou Hardy and we uh, we got on the same page and and we made it happen we raised and this is getting off of the fourth of july festival but they tied together um in, in more ways than people realize okay go ahead um when i took on the the job of being the producer of revolution uh something had to go so um i had uh, many of the J sets that wanted to try their hand at directing the pageant and traveling with the queen and all that stuff. So uh, I graciously let them have it because I had a bigger fish to fry. And it was this outdoor drama that uh, we were going to present for the bicentennial. And it was called Revolution. and. It was actual history uh, of Brunswick Town during that revolutionary time, hmm. and uh, you, you, men you mentioned it when you started uh, Lou, Har Lou Hardy. You want to tell Lou us Lou Hardy. Who, yeah, who's who is Lou Hardy? Oh, I thought. Well, um, that's right. I could say that. I, I just figure everybody knows Lou Hardy, but. Uh, um, so how do you want me to go back to that? Yeah, just, just You'll just splice it or whatever. I don't know what you do afterwards. <laughs> anyway, um, in Southport, we were really blessed because we had so many talented people. And uh, I need to go back to the beginning anyway, okay? okay. Right, I'm not gonna go back to Lou's heart, my conversation with Lou when I accepted to do it. But uh, right after that, uh, I was at a, um, a, with my husband at a Lions Club ladies night where uh, all of the lines brought their wives and we had dinner and we were uh, at the community building as it was then. And uh, so um, the president uh, of the, not the president of the Lions Club, but Bill, uh, uh, hold it, uh, Alnita's husband, Bill Crow, Crow thank you, because he was mayor and everything. I see my magic eight ball. Thank you, Libby. Um, Bill Crow had been asked to be the chairman of the Southport Bicentennial Celebration. So of course I was going to be holding hands with Bill to produce Revolution. Uh, it was a big part of it. So we were, uh, he and his wife, who was a really good friend of mine, and, uh, and my husband and I were sitting uh, at the table and he said to me, he said, I have to have um, a kickoff ceremony for the bicentennial, um, you know, May. It was going to be in May 75. And he said, 
but I need some music or a program of some kind. And uh, is there any way that you could do that or something like that? for me for the bicentennial this before it even been announced that I was going to do the outdoor drama and so I said sure Bill I can do that for you and it was real easy in Southport we had so many talented people and all you had to do was get um, a list of the soloists of all the churches in town and the better singers in the choirs and you had your your choir for the bicentennial and your soloists and everything they were all there so all i had to do was make the phone calls and put the music together in the program so i gathered all these talented people from all the churches and any other kind of organization that provided music together uh, and uh, picked out some some patriotic music and that kind of thing so i got that together for bill for the um the kickoff ceremony and we did it at what then was city hall which is now i guess um, is it still the artist thing the artist association has it's an art gallery well that used to be our city hall so we um, we had the ceremony there and a flag raising and all kinds of stuff and and so I not knowing the directors of all the other churches I just used the uh, the choir director for the Baptist Church which is where I went to church and I was in the choir so I asked him if he would direct this group and in patriotic songs so we got all that together and. Uh, one sidebar to that is um, a real good friend of mine, Cindy Sellers, who we all knew by the name of Cindy Hardy. Uh, she was in our first Fourth of July pageant, but Cindy was known uh, for her talent and her singing talent. And in all the little shows that we put on with Leela Pickett and, and Dorothy Hardy, uh, to raise funds for whatever we need to raise funds for. Um, Cindy, even when she was uh, a teenager and just finishing college and that kind of thing, always participated in those and everybody just loved her and her voice and her talent. So um, when I was putting this group together, Cindy was not in Southport. She and her husband were living in Virginia and it just happened that she walked into my beauty shop a few days uh, before we were to make this presentation on behalf of the Bicentennial Committee. And I said, oh, I'm so glad to see you in town. Will you sing with us? And she said, sure. And she said, I'm not just in town, we've moved back. And so I was doing her hair that day and she had brought her little baby who was five months old, Susanna. And uh, from that point on, Susanna became mine. Uh, but anyway, so I asked Cindy if she'd participate with us and she did. And so after the bicentennial, uh, and, and this is the sidebar now that I'm getting to, after we had that bicentennial celebration and the kickoff for that, then uh, Cindy uh, was in my salon one day getting her hair done and uh, I said uh, I think we ought to keep that group together and let you know f for them to sing for things so you know, we never have enough music in the 4th of July festival parade we could get a float and put our singing group on the float and let them sing all through the parade route and everything because we had this little tiny piano that little picket carried I mean she got that piano to everything in town it was like a half piano hmm. but uh, when the school burned down the story is that Leela 
rushed into the flames and got that little piano and rolled it out of the school building so it wouldn't burn down with the school. So she laid claim to it. And and Lord, she did because there were pictures of her pushing it down the street to get it away from the burning school building. So anyway, we could put that piano on the float real easy and she could play the piano and they could sing all the way through the... Um, parade but so Cindy said to me she said I do think that's a good idea I think we need to keep this group together they have such good voices but I want to be the director and I said sold you sold me on that so there's no problem there <laughs> I didn't know you were going to be in town or you'd have been director from the beginning so that's how Cindy and I collaborated on what is now known as the C Notes Choral Society. Hmm. And, uh, and Cindy can still sing. And it's still, <laughs> and it's still they're still singing. Oh yes, we, uh, uh, we got that thing together. In fact, I raised the money out for the first um, outfits. We started out with choir robes and I gotten uh, uh, I raised the money to get everybody, uh, it was off-white choir robes and we got the little uh, things that you wear around your neck and one side was red and the other side was green. So we could wear it for the 4th of July and then we could turn it over and wear it for other things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's, that's another little story on the side there. But, uh, but anyway, that's how the C Notes Choral Society was born. And uh, uh, we had, we got everybody together and then we had a, like a little contest to figure out what the name was going to be. And everybody was to write down a name for it and the next meeting we were going to, everybody was going to present their names and Alnita Crow came up with that name, the C Notes Choral Society, and uh, and I won't be sure she gets credit for that because it stuck. It was the best, and we were so excited when she said that. So, okay, where am I? Back to Revolution. <laughs> Bob, I wonder, I, I, you know, I have no roadmap for this, so it's just one thing after another. But the main reason I do that is to show how um, there's not just one project that somebody says, let's do, that one thing leads to another thing and everything splinters off and, and becomes something else. And I certainly don't want anybody to think that I want to take credit for doing this, 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 and this. It's just that these things all splinter off. It's like a tree growing. We, we have this small core of people that uh, love to be together and love to participate and and they come up with great ideas and, and we made it happen so that's how the C Notes was born so then to get on to Revolution which was a huge challenge for somebody of my level and thank God I had I had um, Lewis Hardy uh, whispering in my ear all the way because Lou, Lou, as he is known at home, uh, on his professional level, he's always called Louis. But uh, Lou and I became very good friends during this, and he had no problem calling me at any time of the day or night, and and, and saying, this, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and uh, for the museum, I have, uh, we had. Uh, we had a float for Revolution in the Myrtle Beach Sun Fun Parade, which is the biggest festival in South Carolina. And uh, we had our main characters, our Governor Tryon and, and, and um, our Abner Nash and our Justina all in costume on, that, on a float advertising revolution in 1975 
and we won the trophies for the best float in the parade and I still have the trophies and they can certainly go to the museum I would love to see them go there um, and they should be there and and I have a picture of the uh, they wrote a big article about us in that little Sun Fun <laughs> Visitors magazine and had a picture of that float with Governor Tryon and on the cover of the magazine and I, I have a copy of that that can go with the trophies. So like I said one thing begets another, <laughs> begets another, begets another and it keeps going. But um, to get back to revolution um, we everybody was so generous the city of Southport I mean the city of Southport just loved the idea of having this outdoor drama it was an outdoor musical drama it was you know everybody that's been to any of the other outdoor dramas around the country think of of when you go um, they're just dramas accompanied by music but ours was an operetta on stage in an outdoor setting and that made it so different from uh, the other outdoor dramas that across the country and which entitled me to become a part of the uh, the Outdoor Drama Institute at, uh, at Carolina and going there I learned a lot about outdoor dramas and how to make it happen so uh, another another bit of education that I got in one way or another but um, we started casting uh, I mean we had to do the casting and, and people had to be able to sing and they had to be able to act and the the ladies in Southport were making the costumes I mean the costumes were made by anybody that had a sewing machine and could follow instructions with that sewing machine were making costumes um, Lou and I went to uh, fabric stores and and sweetheart and what we took I'll never forget we took a little expedition to uh, upstate North Carolina to to uh, the places the the places that were talked about in revolution that had little museums and things that tied in with our story and the story was outstanding I mean it was a part of North Carolina history that nobody really knew and uh, Bill Falk that ran the uh, the site at Brunswick Town was very very helpful because mm -hmm. he knew the history of Brunswick Town so perfectly and uh, he helped Lou uh, with the historic part of the um, of the play uh, Lou went out there with Bill and did an awful lot of research to that particular period and how we covered the um, the construction of the Tryon Palace and and why Governor Tryon was so he was so pompous and we had one song that's that he sang that said I am the king in America and we and Lou envisioned that's that's the way he felt because he had so much control over this new colony from the king so it was very exciting um, we raised a lot of money um, thank goodness for Kenneth Sprunt that at that time his family owned Orton mm -hmm. and he he really got into it and he filled in the gap at the end we fell short about maybe ten ten or twenty thousand dollars in the Sprunt Institute uh, or him his family donated uh, made up the shortfall but we put our cat we brought our cast in um, and we got their costumes first the lead performers we got their costumes and we went around to civic groups and and uh, we would have um, we'd have special events where we could take 
uh, these people in and Lou would play the piano and they would sing their parts and and he had written a short script uh, very concise and so we did these preview parties all over Brunswick County uh, New Hanover we did several in Wilmington and raise money that way you know if we could do a preview party and raise ten thousand dollars well because we raised fifty thousand dollars to to put this show on and uh, another interesting thing that that ties in with what I said about all of the things that I personally did not to brag on myself but as you know networking is how you get things done and because I had made friends with some people in Charlotte that ran the um, the Carolinas Carousel and they came down and judged our pageant and everything so we had this relationship going on so we had all of our construction crew out building the the platforms for the seating for the our little makeshift amphitheater am i running out of time no, you're good and uh so we had the platforms uh on a raised angle but we didn't have any seats so we didn't know how we were going to get seats and somehow through uh, somebody's research whether it was Lou's or Dorothy's or whose it was uh, uh, possibly it was through the 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 colonel at uh, Sunny Point because it was a uh, military connected but we got word that uh, for at Fort Bragg they were tearing down an old theater and they would donate their seats to us that came out of that theater all we had to do was get them to Southport from Fort Bragg so that's where my friends in Charlotte come in because the guy that was super, was the the person in charge of the Carolines Carousel also worked for Thurston Motor Lines. So I called Dennis and said, "I have a little problem that I think you can help me solve," and and told him what it was, and he said, "No problem." So he sent one of his trucks to Fort Bragg. Thurston Motor Lines truck picked up those seats and brought them to Southport. So it's just those things. And you know, I don't want anybody to ever think that I want to take credit for everything that happened. It's just the networking and knowing people and, and, uh, and the cooperation we got from other people. So anyway, that's how we got seats. And we got theater seats. You know, most of the time when you go to an outdoor drama, you sit on the hard bench. But at Revolution, we had nice theater seats. And then the next big thing was to have get tarps to cover them up when it rained because <laughs> they were nice seats. So, but we managed to find enough donations in Southport to get our tarps. and and cover them when it rained. But it was real interesting to watch Revolution coming into shape and how the local people responded to uh, having this outdoor drama and nobody really understood what it was gonna be. Um, but Lou and I, and then we uh, we hired a, a gentleman named Bob Britton as the director. And Bob was a very handsome man. Very, uh, uh, he was uh, someone that when he walked in a room, everybody knew knew he was there. I mean, because he was very handsome and stately and had this you know theatrical speaking voice and I and who and along with Bob came his wife who was an actress so she was in the show um, 
and so he was paid and then we <clears throat> we had to find a, a technical director who put everything together backstage as far as as all the little things that we needed so Bob knew somebody uh, that could do that so he brought him and we didn't have a whole lot of paid people other than our our leads for our in our cast and and our director and our technical director were all paid people hmm. and uh, so it started coming together once Bob got there and uh, and our technical director started kind of showing our volunteers what they need to be doing so then we had to raise money we had to have an organ to accompany the music and so we found um, a second-hand organ in one of the uh, piano stores in Wilmington and we managed to go and raise enough money to get that or we got it, we got it we worked out a deal with the store and they financed it for us. We got we got the organ, but we got the coupon book too. So um, anyway, it was kind of exciting. It was really exciting uh, when it started coming together. And the, the ladies of Southport were sewing costumes and they were planning meals because when these little actors, we found some vacant home houses through some of the realtors um, that we could uh, we rented cots and for them to sleep on and put them we made dormitories for all these people because um, I didn't mention it but Lou Hardy at that time was um, Lewis Hardy Jr. Uh, was the um, he was the music director for the American Academy of Theatrical Arts in New York so he taught a lot of students and he actually cast our show with his students from New York so that's why we had to have and we had a lot of town people in it too but they kind of learned from our actors but we had a lot of people that were experienced uh, in theater some thought they were more experienced than others but that was up to Lou I didn't have to worry about that that was a that was up to Lou and Bob I just had to worry about raising the money to pay for it all and uh, it was exciting it was exciting to see the costumes coming out of production and people being fitted it was exciting to see our local people and the the parts that they played whether it was uh, in the technical side whether it was on stage whether it was both uh, but it it came together it was like magic and uh, it took a lot of people don't understand how when you come out of Franklin Square Park to where they now art museum is there was some wide open space back there because the high school gym backed that up and um, there was another little building there that used to be the marineology teaching center so they were facing over on Atlantic Avenue from the park mm -hmm. So we used the, uh, the gymnasium for a lot of the technical stuff and we used the little, um, we used the little building that was a marineology building. We used that for like um, uh, dressing, keeping our costumes and things in there. And then the, um, we went around and, and the Methodist church had some buildings there too because that's the way it was going you know around there so the Methodist Church let us use some of their outbuildings too so we uh, and so that open center there was where we built our theater hmm. and it was very magical to see the construction going on and the seats coming in and and uh, 
and then we use the gymnasium for our lighting um, equipment and our spotlights and everything we built platforms and things in the gymnasium so you could see you know and the local guys uh, most of them are the rescue squad with my husband and they were trained uh, doug was very good with the technical side and uh, other than the legal side that he helped me do but uh, but yeah, they, they all learned how to do lighting and I can see them now. They, uh, and that helped me too with the pageant after that because these guys had gotten so experienced <laughs> in lighting. And when we moved the pageant to the Baptist Assembly Auditorium, which was more professional after the school burned and we didn't have an auditorium in town. Uh, so anyway just one thing kept going into another meanwhile the festival was growing and the 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 revolution was being everybody was excited about the bicentennial things that were going on and and we were busy raising money and and getting everything together and so the local ladies made the costumes and when the costumes were done and the production was on, they cooked the meals for the actors and people that we had in residence in our makeshift uh, dormitories around town. So it was truly a community event um, in whatever way they could Southport people participated in this event and it was really well known all across the state and people came I mean uh, you don't know how that feels to a producer that didn't know what she was doing to see those seats fill up at night and hear those voices and that music and we had um, the guy that was director of the uh, Institute of Organization, oh, no, I'm in the wrong word, the Institute of Outdoor Drama at Chapel Hill. And we became real good friends with him. He came to opening night and then he wrote a, he wrote a review that at the time we didn't think was very complimentary. But as we looked at it more, we understood what he was saying because, and he, he said um, that in the beginning, he didn't think too kindly about our show. But as he thought more about it and looked at, um, cause he had recorded it, uh, and looked at it, he realized that he was measuring it by the other outdoor dramas, uh, which are called symphonic dramas, which are plays with musical accompaniment. But that Revolution was truly an operetta done in an outdoor setting. So it was unique in, in what it offered. And so um, he reprised his, um, his critique of revolution later. And uh, as I said, we got to be real good friends and he helped me a lot when we were trying to, um, we were trying to continue revolution. It was just that it was in a bad time in the 70s when the uh, national economy was not in real good shape if you remember there was a shortage on gas and mm -hmm. all this stuff was going on in the late 70s so at that time we did not have um, we didn't have a way to raise money for the continuation so the board, instead of continuing to meet every few weeks, because we had nothing to meet about, so my board was uh, 
they didn't want to go to meetings with something that, uh, as I said, we at that time were not continuing. We just had hopes of and not trying to continue. And we paid the guy that was the technical director, we paid him to stay and see what we could do about fundraising and that kind of thing. But uh, when we met with the board after a couple of months later, they felt it was a waste of their time because most of them were heads of different kind of, I you know, we had the guy that was head of CPNL and and uh, we just had some very prominent people on our board. So they uh, asked me if I would consider as a producer if I would continue to uh, to manage the affairs of Revolution Incorporated. Uh, so they appointed me the person to keep it going to see what I, I mean I always <laughs> I didn't know how to say no to especially the things I liked. So anyway, uh, I did that and I, I, I maintained their um, assets. Uh, we had all of our assets stored in a room in the old city hall because it, it was then after revolution they, they turned it over. When the county moved out of their buildings that were around town, uh, when the new county seat was set up in Bolivia. And so Brunswick County had a lot of buildings that they turned over to the city. And uh, so they moved the city hall into what had been the county courthouse. And uh, so they did, though the city, before they moved out of the city hall, they um, they procured the the one office in the back corner to be set aside for revolution, mm. and so that's where I had all the lighting equipment, all the costumes, all the fabrics that weren't turned into costumes, um, our records. Everything was in that one room, and I kept it there for a long, long time. So, um, we were never able to uh, revive Revolution. We did a lot of other things pertaining to it because we were hoping to actually build an amphitheater at Brunswick Town for the continuation of revolution mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Falk who was uh, in charge of Brunswick Town at that time he and I and Lou Hardy had gone to uh, the uh, meet with the state cultural resources division and they were we made a nice presentation to them uh, and showed them slides of the show and uh, so they uh, they were going to work with us on the property at Brunswick Town uh, to construct an amphitheater. And uh, so I actually uh, got a grant from the uh, from the state uh, of twenty thousand dollars to um, to investigate uh, the the property that we were going to have at Brunswick Town, ticks and all. And so I went out there with Bill Falk and the architect that was going to draw the, uh, or design the amphitheater for us, and we walked through the path that was going to be uh, our little journey up to the theater. and. Uh, and Lord knows when I got home, I was loaded with ticks from one end to the other. Uh, but uh, it was really fun, and we actually did get, the architect did draw uh, a design for our amphitheater. And uh, I'm not casting any disparagements against any 
political parties, but that year um, the state changed parties. So everything that had been approved through the uh, past regime was kind of canceled. So we did our our agreement with the uh, Division of Cultural Resources kind of fell through the cracks. But anyway, I did get a nice um, architectural design for an amphitheater to be built at, at Brunswick Town. And, uh, but all that changed with the political stuff in Raleigh, so. Anyway, so that was it for that.